Um, okay, we're gonna we're gonna talk about something that happened to all of you when you were a little kid. And if you were in an ethnic neighborhood like me, it might have happened at a baptism or a confirmation or a family wedding or something. Then maybe it made you put on a cute little suit and you're about this tall. And if it was an ethnic event like this, some guy probably smelling a little bit of garlic and cigar smoke would come over and tossle your hair. And what would he say to you? And how are you? Well, that would be one thing. Yeah. How about, and what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> and if we think about that for a second, that question came up time and time and time again, right? You went to your first grade school and the nun would talk to you. If, if you did as I did, you know, you could, it explains a lot about my life. Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, Catholic college, year law school, beaten up by the nuns and the brothers at every single stage of the process. But we were defined in many ways because in those earliest days, what, the, the biggest choices we ever got to make were chocolate or vanilla. Or remember when you pinned over at the top of the page of the Christmas card catalog, or the Christmas catalog, right, and insisted on this monstrous list of toys that we were all designed, deserved because we had, had been such good boys and girls. What do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, it, it's a question, Kathy, that we asked ourselves almost every year. Some of us took back in the day aptitude tests. One of my best friends was told he, was, he had qualified to be a shepherd. Um, <laughs> he became a veterinarian, interestingly enough. There was some relationship. So we quickly were defined by this seminal question in our lives, what do you want to be when you grow up? And every time we thought about that question, we had to make some adjustments. Where did you go to high school? Right? And then you went to St. Joe's, as, as I know, Dan, you, you did with me. And they, did you take the pre-college classes? Or did you go out and work in the shop with the guys who got their hands dirty and got to get, build the fastest cars? Constantly making adjustments. What do you want to be when you grow up? And every today was filled with this accent on tomorrow about where were you going, what were you going to be, and how you were going to do that. That place in our lives. And when we talk about a sense of place, it is a physical location, because communities have places too, right? There was a time when Menor Avenue actually didn't have 8,000 stores and a chance to get into a rear-end accident every time you were stopped to look which way you needed to turn. Mentor grew. Mentor wanted to be, what was it going to be when it grew up? And as Mentor grew, or as Lake County grew, or as Geauga or Chesterland grew, people came back and they, they answered that question. What do you want to be, Joe, when you grow up? I want you to think back. I came from a family of nine on my mom, eight on my mom's side and six on my dad's side. So that was 14 uncles. I knew what every single one of their jobs was. And I related to what they did from, from real estate, to pipe fitters, to bricklayers, to laborers, to liquor store owners. I drove in the back of Uncle John's delivery truck. Back before it was, back when it was illegal for me to be toting cases of paper onto people's front porches in Collinwood. But we all knew what people's place was in life, right? We knew what place they went to on Sundays. We knew what place they went to to party. We knew what place was. And they constantly made decisions about place predicated on, not necessarily yesterday, because yesterday connected you to those roots. Those roots pushed the growth in a certain direction. But it was always, as Bill Clinton's campaign song was, never stop, never forget thinking about tomorrow. Never stop thinking about tomorrow. And so we built up this entire amount of muscle and brain memory that had us entirely focused making future decisions based on the predicate of our past. Communities did that too. This sense of place, this, this whole sense of, and we, and we know that by the way. When you're buying a car and after a half hour of conversation with the auto dealer and you're going back and forth, finally he or she says to you, so where are we? Our teenage answer would be, we're in the showroom. Um, <laughs> But he wants to know where we are in our head. And so as we think about a sense of place, and as we think about our communities who are place-bound locations, for which many of us may have not always lived, always lived here, nonetheless find itself challenged about, about thinking about its tomorrow. 
Then there comes this kind of unique thing that happens. I'm a huge baseball fan. I made it to Class A, but I quickly realized at some point in time I was not going to be a shortstop for the Cleveland Indians. Because guess what? All the shortstops for the Cleveland Indians were now a third of my age. And you quickly realize, as we think about place, an entire life of making decisions based upon place, where to go to college, where to marry, where to live, where to work, where to commute from, where to commute to. All of those decisions were yesterday. And as we think about it at 48, oh, there's still many tomorrows. And we think about it at 58, there's still some tomorrows. But as you start to close in on the 60s, we realize that that scale starts to tip a little. But there are, we are place bound, all of the decisions that we made, where to live, where to work, and what to do, are now mostly in at the our past. And that there are many more yesterdays than tomorrows. And at, for some folks, that can be a very emotionally challenging phenomenon. For a city, it can be more emotionally a challenging phenomenon. Right now, more than 50% of the people in Lake and Geauga County are over 50 years of age. I want you to think about that for a second. That is a huge number. I want you to think about Lake County, who now has income that is absolutely perfectly stagnant. I want you to think about the fact that there are now more housing permits for remodeling old roofs than there are housing building permits for building new roofs. A city is doing the same thing that we are doing. And if we just simply let these phenomena come down upon us and descend upon us like it did from that very first conversation, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a cowboy. Well, that was kind of cute once upon a time. But now we have 68 years, that's my age, of accumulated what did I want to do's. And you now wonder, all this cool stuff that I have back here, what do I do with it? What does a community that now has more roofs being remodeled than new ones being built do with it? We have a phenomenon in our region where we now have as many people dying as are being born. I want you to think about that for a second. As many people dying as are being born. And in the heyday of the News Herald, it was an ascendancy, right? We were building new schools. We were building new shopping centers. Senior citizen centers were nice amenities, right, Dan, in the first levies passed, not because all the old people voted for them, but before the younger people voted for them because they wanted to take care of their grandparents. Guess what? We are the grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> so as communities age as a different place, and as people age as a different place, we realize we used to work here, we used to live here, but you know, where are, you know, where are we now? This whole be, what do you want to be when you grow up, however, is still a completely functionally relevant question for us at 68 as much as it was at 18. Because the reality of our muscle and intellectual brain memory is that we are the complete product of what we think about the future from what we have experienced in the past. And if you think about it, what you know is what you've done. Now we can intellectually change that by coming to a place such as this. And by the way, I never went to a single classroom in grade school or high school that looked like this. <laughs> but it changed. And by the way, it changed on time and under budget. Congratulations to Lakeland. You fulfilled your promise to the community in, 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 in doing this. And then we hear about buildings being repurposed. And how cool is that? How do we take an old kind of dumpy, crappy building sitting off somewhere and they get some money from the county and they get some money from the developer and they repurpose it? When was the last time they talked about Trish U being repurposed? <laughs> okay. That can sound awfully weird, especially if you're an immigrant trying to cross over from Mexico. <laughs> so the repurposing of us does not mean that you turn a building into a swimming pool. It means you take for what the original purpose may have been intended, what do you want to be when you grow up, and make it into a new purpose at 68 that you didn't really know what, what it could exist when you were eight. Communities and you do that. The most important thing that's been suggested that we need to be in life is useful. I want you to think about that for a second. How do you feel when somebody says thank you? You just kind of did something for them. You may have only held the door open for a woman struggling with the in her, her grocery bags or her toddler, but you were useful to her in an important time in her life. What we now know in that segue of more yesterdays than tomorrow <coughs> is continuing to find, as 
somebody over here mentioned, how to continue to be useful. Here to be useful for the emotional satisfaction and intellectual satisfaction that's critical. And for a community that's having as many people dying as are being born today. That is spending more time fixing old things up than building new things. Now this is not bad. But what it tells us is that we and our communities are at a tipping point. We can continue to seek a progressive, and I don't say that as a, as a philosophical, ideological point of view. Progressive simply meaning continuing to believe that tomorrow both exists and, in fact, can be better than today. That's really what a progressive, what a progressive value is. And that we are not just simply a, pri a prisoner of our experiences, but we have the capability to leverage it. Yes, we are at zero population growth. Yes, our income is, is fixed and stagnated. Yes, although property valuations move, that's as much a function of the economy as it is as the inherent value of the house or the community in, 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 in which it's fine. So our job here today is to think about how to continue, Joe, to leverage all of your yesterdays into tomorrow for our community. Because if we don't, here's what's happening. 25 years ago, there was a growing population. And when it came your time, my grandfather's time, to quit, there were a lot more people there to step up. Because our temptation made to be say, hey, hell, I raised my family. I coached the Little League. I ran the PTA. It's somebody else's turn. The fact is, with declining population base and with fixed income, and with this problem that we have called Florida, which is directly related to winter, <laughs> i.e. we want to avoid one and embrace the other, we have less people to pick up for us as we slide into, into the 60s. So as a why and as a library, what you need to think about is your customer is coming to you in a completely different mindset, physically, intellectually, emotionally, and time-wise. I've heard from several police chiefs that one of the largest burdens they have in the wintertime now are the people who, and they used to do this as a service, for you might know some folks, they'd call the police and say, hey, you know, we're going to Florida for January, February, or March, just make sure you drive by. <laughs> well, back 20 years ago, that was cool, and like there were 10 of those houses now. I can give you the names of several communities in which that list of houses is in the hundreds. That means they're gone. And by the way, when they go, they open up a bank account in Naples, and they join a church in Naples, and they join a country club in Naples, and they get friends in Naples, and they don't come back the end of February. They stay till the middle of March, and maybe they wait until Easter, and slowly but surely they become more disconnected from their home, more absent from their home. That doesn't mean they don't love us. It doesn't mean they're actually not smarter than us, because they are there. <laughs> <laughs> But what it means is that our community is on this cusp of this tremendous amount of talent built up with all these years of yesterdays. Whatever those yesterdays were for you, and however you began to answer that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And have to realize that you don't stop answering that question when you reach <coughs> 50s or 60s. Because if we do, two things will happen. I guarantee you will personally stagnate and not be a very happy camper. It's just, I'm not a psychologist, I just read a lot. I stayed in a hotel, a Holiday Inn Express one night. <laughs> but what we do know for sure as an, as an elected official or others who have covered elected officials or deal with the public in a public service providing context, know that if you do not continue to engage the people for whom you exist, you will lose them. They're gone. And as we get older, the more I start to slide into, I need the YMCA less. Because I get older, it's harder for me to get back. I'm not rising. It's not like I'm 28, I'm going to be 38. I can still do this. Simple story, you've all experienced it. I made it to class A, and whatever that was. And I had a shoulder injury. And then I did it again like 30 years later. And they happened to have the old x-rays and the new images. I said, man, don't worry, doctor, I'm really going to rehab myself. He said, well, you're going to get back to about 90%. 90%? Hell, I'm going to get back to 100%. And he said, you see these little dots? 
I didn't have arthritis when I was 28. It's inescapable. I cannot be 100% again physically. So. so how we deal with that is really, really important. How we deal with people's changed expectations for their tomorrows and changed communities' expectations for their tomorrows is really, really critical if counties like Lake and Geauga are going to survive. Are going to survive because there are increasing demands on us as we go into our tomorrows from our yesterdays that are physical, intellectual, financial, emotional. When your grandkids move away, I guarantee you the anchor that keeps you here moves with them. And that is happening every day. So as we talk about a sense of place, David, wherever, wherever you are, it's the place that exists in us to continue to be useful, to continue to be relevant, to continue to be emotionally attached to what we call home. Because if we do, we have that capacity realizing that there's not many, there are not as many coming from behind us. And that therefore we need to embrace what the opportunity or opportunities are. And secondly, you're just going to be a lot more happy camper. Because happiness at the end of the day is, is, is really what it's kind of all about. So it, 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 it's kind of getting past, you know, I've done my time. It's, it, it's one thing as we contemplate this to talk about you know, where we lay our heads, that's our home, and what's going on in our heads. And that's our passion for a second chapter, or a third chapter, or a fourth chapter. And David, I think that's kind of why we're here today. For our own personal growth, Still answering that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And for our community, what does it want to be as it grows up? We really don't have the luxury of saying, I did my time. Now, many of us did that, and I guess if you say that, you know, there's, there's no one, I guess, impugns that because it is, in fact, true. But you're here because we do value our community, and I think we need to find continued ways to both connect energize and mobilize with our neighbors and our friends and our family and that little inner space because when we make ourselves happy we make other people happy that hopefully is is a little bit of a context or a frame framework for, for our conversations today we have enablers who are going to lead us I think in further conversation uh, I want to thank you you know I want to thank all of you for, for, for coming. Every little bit that we do you know, makes a huge difference, I think, to, uh, to all of us. Uh, and I would just close with, with one, one last little thought. If we don't do it, who will? And if we don't start doing it now, when will be the best time? And the reality is, is that there's not enough folks coming up to do it. And yesterday, the start it is not even too soon. Because our tomorrows, as I said, have horizons on them now. And it's our job to give a meaning to that walk to that horizon that each of us and each of our communities is, is going to be facing going forward. So 